our study reflections. It's not, uh, it's not a lecture, it's, uh, but it's in English. <laughs> but it's just an exchange of ideas, of some of the insights that we had while we did this, um, this work, this study. This, I like to tell why I start studying a theme. Um, I think uh, it explains the reasons why it became or why I chose the, the, the subject the way I did. And uh, we are studying Paul and Steve on Wednesdays uh, evenings. This study it starts, the book starts with Stephen's story. And the, the life, his life, was a huge example of hope. All his words, all his, uh, uh, the way he dealt with his, uh, his challenges, everything talked about, taught us about hope and the cycles that comes with it and the faith. And then we're gonna go into a little bit of a definition of hope. Right? What, we, what hope are we talking about? So in the dictionary we say, uh, they say, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Usually, good, right? Tonight we are hoping that this hurricane, Darian, is not going to hit us or it's not going to be as strong as they're saying it's going to be. And if it is, that everybody is uh, safe and sound, that it doesn't cause much problems, right? Um, it's a feeling of truth. We, t we, we trust that something good is, come, is gonna come out of it. We trust that we have uh, enough, um, enough uh, support from the universe, from God, from whoever it is, the creator, the primary cause of everything that everything's going to be fine at the end. At the end of the day, it will all work out, right? Now in the Bible, there are uh, this, there's this uh, definition as well that we call the theological defini definition of hope, which is this confident expectation of what God has promised. What has God promised? So he put in our spiritual DNA that one day we all are going to be good. We all are going to be into this Christic, angelic phase. Not here in the Spiritism when we study this, this one, once we get there. It's not the one that you're going to get into heaven, sit on the clouds, and play the lyra the whole eternity. No. What is shown here to us is the guide and model of the master. So the moment he became a Christic spirit, a Christ, what did he have to do? Work. He, has, he had to work, right? Okay, so now I know all that I had to know from myself. I uncovered the whole submersed iceberg that I am. I know everything that I had to know about myself and I am a complete being of light. There's no more shadows. So now I can go out and take care of people. Take care of the ones that I love, build a place for them to live or not and a beautiful place, by the, by the way. This blue planet is one of the most beautiful places for us, right? And we, all, we have this saying that says, hope is the last to die and the last to be born. We, I put this picture there, something that is growing in nothing in this dry land. And Sometimes we go through moments when everything is dry, we have nothing to go to, we got to our rock bottom, and from then on, there's nothing but grow, right? 
Okay, so I got to my, my bottom. From here, there's nothing that can become worse. What am I going to do from now on? Work, right? Two opposites, one because it became light, and the other one because it's so dark that there's nothing else to do. And we meet, and we meet in the extremes. Well, but then, what does the scriptures tell about hope? I'm gonna start with Peter. When we read Paul and Stephen, there are many passages that Peter shows up. And we're going to see Peter as this human being with a lot of problems, like us. He had this temper that he fought for Christ, right, for Jesus, when he was, being, uh, when he was going to jail, going to be incarcerated. Peter goes in there with a the sword and cuts the ear of the centurion, the, the guard, the Roman that came to, to, to take Jesus, to arrest Jesus. So wasn't it from, and Peter was the one who Jesus was every day with him, living in his house, breakfast together, going fishing together, spending the whole day in a boat. What are you gonna talk about? So they were probably the ones who were taught the most, heard the most, was shown the example the most, and still he had this temper. He still he was the one who denied Jesus three times, wasn't it? And this was what brought him still this, when he, at the end of his life, he was bringing all his teaching, healing people, and he was still saying, I was the one who committed the most mistakes, gave him the humility to, and the authority to talk about, right? When people make mistakes, he, we can say, don't worry. I did, I did this too, and it's fine. Everything's gonna be fine. And he says on his, um, on his uh, app store, in his letter, he says, and the God of all grace, who called you to this eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Or he's saying, after you suffer a little while you're suffering, through God's mercy and grace, he will restore you. You will be a good spirit at the end of the day. And coming from this, uh, coming from him is, is a lot more touching than coming from somebody that, somebody that had no mistakes, right? When he tells us this. Now, we're, we're, I told you guys we're studying Paul and Stephen, right? Paul was this person who he was Jewish, he was a Pharisee, he was a doctor of the law, he believed in his, in his God, he really truly loved the God that he believed, but this God showed him a way that he needed to be the right person. His God was better than all the other people's. His religion was the one that he wanted to bring everywhere around the world. And because of that, he thought that anybody who said anything against or had any other belief was not to be considered the uh, in, right? That was considered a uh, friend or was considered part of the family or considered part of his group. And they had to change their mind. They had to change their mind, otherwise they would be killed. But he changes. He changes when Jesus, when he meets Jesus in the desert. He sees that this, this belief that he had was in a misunderstood direction, right? So he understands, he changes his mind 
because he now understands, his, he has a better understanding. And the same strength, the same belief, and the same way that he professed his faith before, he was willing to go everywhere. He was willing to go all over the world, in every temple, in every synagogue, to tell them the Messiah has already arrived. It didn't matter what he had to go through, but he needed to tell his truth. And he used, he used to say, whoever souls to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So he's giving us this, not just hope, it's a certainty. He's assuring us that it's giving us, guiding us where we have to put our work on. So we are running after a lot of bills to pay, and it's fine. It is, it is designed that way, so we don't spend too much time messing up. You go, you work, you do what you have to do, but at the end of the day, pay attention to what is eternal. Your spiritual life will be there after your body is gone, beyond the grave. Not just yours, everybody's. Okay? Reaping this eternal life is something that we learn to do every day. Every day here. We sleep, we learn a little bit about the spiritual life. We wake up, okay. What I've learned on the other side, I have to apply here. We are multidimensional beings. There's no other way. You are here in the physical. You are in the spiritual at the same time. You are being influenced all the time. You have a legion of friends around you. Spiritual. If we read the, the Spirit's book, there's a question there. Are we influenced by the spirits? And the answer is all the time, more than you can imagine. Most of the time, they are the ones making the decisions for us. What does that mean? What does that mean? First of all, we learn here that we start by association. We have a thought, we have a vibration that attracts the spirits that are next to us. We live in the same frequency level. Um, if we look around us, amongst us, some of us, under the same circumstances, will react like they are in heaven, and some of us, with the same exact fact, the same exact situation, will feel like they are in hell. Where is heaven and hell, if not in our own self? And sometimes it changes during the day. Sometimes in the morning, we are in heaven. And then by lunchtime, Hurricane Cat 4, gosh, what am I going to do? I'm running after gas. All the gas stations are closed. Gas is gone. I'm now in this desperation. I have the despair effect, right? I call it the despair effect the hurricane effect. So, during the day, I'm in heaven and I'm in hell. What changed? It was not the location, it was not my body, it was just the situation around me. I, myself, allowing the situation around me to influence my state of mind. So what is the most important? What is around me or what is in my mind? I, in my mind, can decide. Right? So, Paul, in another letter to Romans, he says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can have this myriad of reactions to whatever happens to us. I can be calm. It's going to be a hurricane. What do I need to do to prepare? Make a list, get whatever you need, 
If you don't find it in the first store, you go to the second until you find it. And believe me, you will find it. In this country, they have trucks, planes flown to us. We had like the last hurricane, uh, Irma. I had, my son was in, in Orlando and the hurricane was supposed to hit us here, this side. And he was like, well, mom, I'm going to Tennessee with some friends. Now, guess what? The whole family decided to go to Tennessee. There was no more place for the friends. So he was, I'm going to um, Tampa. I'm like, are you nuts? If you're going to Tampa, just might as well come home. So he drove home. He was the only car driving south. Everybody was driving north. People stayed on the road for five hours to get to Orlando. And it was him and all the gas trucks that were coming down to fill up the, 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 the gas stations. The hurricane deviated to the west coast, hit Tampa, all the places where he was going to go. He went to Tennessee as well. Uh, and we stayed home, had a few wind, yes, wind and rain, but it didn't hit us the way it was supposed to. And we had a safe, uh, safe turnout. Um, but it was just to show how sometimes we make decisions. We, we make these hasty decisions in, in a hurry. And I have friends who went to Orlando and got hit by the hurricane. Some of them had no gas on the way because there was so much traffic. And where is this hope in what God fills us with? It's already there. Everybody had it. Some make the decision. And there's no, there's no wrong decisions here. You decide to go, you decide to stay. It doesn't matter. Right? It's just to show that God is everywhere. There's nobody without God. There's no outside of God. There's no way to leave Him. Right? But sometimes this overflow is so big and it over, it really overflows because we are smaller. Right? God has to be bigger. But everything comes in and you're the size of this little cup. Right? And this, all this light coming down and it's like overflowing. We are not able to take it all. And then Paul in Romans chapter 8 is going to say, who hopes for what they already have? Does anybody hope for something that you already have? You already live in a nice house. Do you hope for a nice house? No, you hope for something better, right? You hope for something else or for somebody else. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We ask, we wait for it because there is a timing, right? Faith in God includes faith in God's timing. So there is a, a joke that says, uh, a guy is asking God, God, what is, um, what is one second for you? And God says, oh, it's the same as one million years for you. And what is a cent for you? Oh, it's like one billion dollars for you. And then the guy says, so God, can you give me one cent? And God's like, in a sec. Right? There is a timing. God's timing. If we are not patient and we free rush, we miss it. We miss it in despair. We get anxious. We get depressed. Right? Because we're not in God's timing. And then in Romans it says, we also glory in your sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. So we go through these experiences that we call suffering, but in reality they are challenges. So these challenges make you somehow get out of it. You become creative. You become a crisis come and you somehow get out of it. You somehow overcome it. 
time passes, you look back, you're like, mm, I did it, I made it. It makes you stronger. It makes you believe in this, I have to keep trying, and I have to give God its own time. And then your character starts building up. You become stronger. We become better people. We become more patient. We become more tolerant. We understand that people have their time. It may not be their time now. It's okay. It's fine. Sometimes we, if, we are, uh, if we are out of the timing, we rush people. You have to go there. You have to come with me. You have to learn this. You have to understand this now. Otherwise, that urgency, right? The time, uh, the, the world is going to end. But when we understand that God has his own time, we put ourselves in the flow. And we respect. We respect other people's moments, other people's phase. We understand there is an evolutionary process that everybody needs to go through. And usually, we are put in a family or with friends or in a workplace where the phases are off. Usually, if you, if you are a person who is a type A, you're not going to get married to a type A person. You're not even going to be friends. You're not going to even stand enough time to become, to be, to fall in love, much less marry, right? So we tend to be with people that are off. Why? We need opposites. We need, opposites. We need differences, right? We have the same ones on the spiritual plane. You're not going to want the same here. You, we need differences to grow. We need to understand other points of view. We need to respect other ways of thinking, other ways of believing. Right? Otherwise, we just stay the same. Now, Stephen, he, used, he was a Jewish, and his father used to, I mean, his mother used parents father and mother, but his mother uh, passed away once he was, when he was very young. But she taught him about a loving God, this God that was joy, happiness, Merciful. that merciful, right? loving. And they used to study the scriptures. At the time, they used to, every time they had a question, they had a doubt, they had something going on, they would sit down and read the scriptures. Why will the scriptures tell me? Almost about uh, the way we do our gospel at home or when we do our readings of, uh, of, uh, of the gospel, we open a page and we read what the message is for the day. So they used to do like that. But Stephen was very, very into Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet from the Old Testament and he taught talked about and taught about Jesus, the Messiah, right? Not Jesus, about the Messiah that the Jews were uh, expecting. Uh, it still are, right? But when he taught about the Messiah, he would not just tell, he would give details of many things that are brought by Jesus. And many times he was saying, I did this, or this happened, so the prophecy is confirmed, right? And Isaiah has a lot of this. And he, he was a prophet who lived like 800 years before, eight centuries before Christ. And um, he's going to say, those who hope in the Lord will renew the strength. So our strength is going to be renewed uh, there's going to be growth, there's going to be tolerance, there's going to be betterment, right? We will get better from this. Now, I wanted, um, I wanted to um, bring you guys a, 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 just a summary from, show, show this a, a summary from, from what I understood from all these teachings. 
So it's said to us that the spirits tell us on the evolutionary path, we are for the animals what the angels are for us. So what we expect from the angels, protection, inspiration, support, is what the intelligent principle in the animals expect from the humans. And I wanted to show you because it touched me when I saw it this way, when I saw this movie in this way. Um, what we expect and what they expect from us. It's, uh, it's going to be like a child, us watching a child right, uh, in kindergarten trying to get into college, more or less. Right? Uh, can you turn off the light for me, please? And you guys, at the end, you tell me if you saw the same thing.
bacanas para a gente. Quando você pode ser na luz? <risos> Dá para... Sorry, speaking in Portuguese here, all of a sudden. It gives you hope, doesn't it? It gives, it gives a lot of hope in humanity. But it's the same way we look up at our protectors, at our mentors, looking up for, for protection, for inspiration. But the thing is, as we, we are not anymore in the phase where we don't think there is no conscience or there is no reason. We already, we already as human beings, we gain that, we conquer that. So the moment we conquer reason, there is this notion that we have to do our duty. We have to do our part, right? When Jesus says, what do you want? What do you want from me? We have to know the answer. Master, I want to see. I want to walk. If I don't know, if I keep myself unconscious, He will stay with us. God will stay with us until we become conscious, until we do our part. Right? So I hope you enjoyed. I hope that you have a good evening, and I hope that we all grow together, we all understand better each other. I'm going to go through the, the uh, whatever we have to, to tell you. So that was it. That was it for tonight, what I wanted to share with you, the reflections that I wanted to share with you.